of the most powerful couples in politics for the last few decades, the Clintons' continued political influence has not been without complication. I believe this country is clearly in decline. And I want to win. I want a new majority for change that reclaims our leadership, restores the middle class, and rebuilds the future for our children. That's what this election is about, and I hope you will help me do it. As Hillary Clinton has assumed more and more of the spotlight due to her run for the presidency and her subsequent appointment to Secretary of State, she has had to confront allegations and assumptions that somehow Bill Clinton, her husband and former president of the United States, is still in the driving seat, asserting power behind the scenes. Because the Clintons are closely aligned in many aspects of policy and both highly driven individuals, Creating a clear divide is tricky at best. Born in Hope, Arkansas on August 19, 1946, Clinton never knew his natural father. He had been killed in a car accident three months before his birth. In 1950, his mother married a car salesman who turned out to be a violent alcoholic that sometimes physically abused her. Although he assumed the use of his stepfather's surname, it was not until Billy, as he was known then, turned 14 that he formally adopted the surname Clinton as a gesture towards his stepfather. While he was a senior in high school, Clinton traveled to Washington, D.C. as part of Boys Nation, a special youth leadership conference. The group was invited to the White House where young Clinton shook hands with President John F. Kennedy, an event that became one of the most memorable of his youth and which sparked an early interest in entering politics. Upon graduation, he won a Rhodes Scholarship to University College, Oxford, where he studied philosophy, politics and economics. After Oxford, Clinton attended Yale Law School, where he earned a Juris Doctor degree. It was here in the Yale Library in 1971, where he met fellow law student Hilary Rodham, who was a year ahead of him. After only about one month, Clinton proposed to Rodham and postponed his plans to be a coordinator for the McGovern campaign for the 1972 United States presidential election in order to move in with her in California. They later married on October the 11th, 1975, and their only child, Chelsea, was born on February 27th, 1980. In 1974, Clinton was a first-year law professor and ran for the House of Representatives. He was defeated but remained undaunted and ran for Attorney General of Arkansas, unopposed in 1976. He went on to run for Governor of Arkansas in 1978 and won, becoming the youngest governor of the state. But the small towns and rural areas of the South are still the poorest parts of the country. It's still the part of the country that has the lowest level of education, highest infant mortality rates, except for the big cities, and a lot of problems that, uh, that need to be addressed in terms of targeted efforts to diversify the economy and to upgrade the education system. So I still think that the South is a distinctive region that, that's going to need some attention in the next uh, administration. He was defeated in the 1980 election, but returned to office in 1982. In the early 1980s, Clinton made reform of the Arkansas education system a top priority, transforming it from the worst in the nation into one of the best. During the aftermath of the Gulf War, President Bush's approval ratings were extremely high. During one point after the successful performance by US forces in Kuwait, President Bush's approval ratings were 89%. As a result, several high-profile candidates refused to seek the Democratic nomination for president. The Democrats lacked a high-profile viable candidate to face an incumbent Republican president. Still, several candidates such as Bill Clinton, Paul Songas and Jerry Brown chose to run. A vision, a uh, sense of uh, 
understanding what our needs are, what the real problems are. We need a change, and I'm not sure who the change is going to be. Clinton, a southerner with experience governing a more conservative state, positioned himself as a centrist new Democrat and presented an impressive case for himself and his party. Well, I think you have to talk about uh, the record that you've had. I've produced 11 surpluses, it's real discipline and budget spending. I've proven that you can reallocate government money from the same old government to investment in the future. And I think I have shown by the vigor of this campaign a determination to stand up for the middle class and restore our country's strength here at home, as well as to stand up for it abroad. In October 1991, five-term Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton declared he was running for President of the United States. For the team starting to build around him, it was political love at first sight. Clinton appeared to be the centrist, charismatic candidate for whom they'd been waiting. He prepared for a run in 1992 amidst a crowded field seeking to beat the incumbent President George H.W. Bush. In the 12 years of Ronald Reagan and George Bush, no state rose so high nor fell so far. It was a story of credit and debt, of expansion and overextension, followed by bankruptcy. People had lost their jobs and increasingly their homes. Into this walks a man who would be president and his wife Hillary, who visited couples in trouble and represented hope, change and vision. Well, the truth is, this country is in trouble. We're in a recession that came to New Hampshire, signed, sealed, and delivered by the policies of the Bush administration. Governor of Arkansas Bill Clinton was selected as the nominee through a series of primary elections and caucuses, culminating in the 1992 Democratic National Convention held from July 13 to July 16, 1992, in New York City. People are beginning to believe in the possibility of change again. During the 92 Democratic Convention, the convention hall was plagued by the fact that independent candidate Ross Perot was tied with or beating Clinton in opinion research polls. This caused a moderate turn of events at the convention to win back Perot voters from the Perot campaign. This led to the selection of such speakers such as Representative Barbara Jordan from Texas to deliver a bipartisan keynote address to the convention delegates. Also speaking was the vice presidential nominee, Al Gore, who appealed to the center as he was, at the time, a southern moderate Democrat from Tennessee. However, on the last day the convention convened on July 16, 1992, Ross Perot dropped out of the presidential race and left a gap for both Bush and Clinton to scramble for newly undecided voters. Now that we have changed the world, it's time to change America. I call this approach a new covenant, a solemn agreement between the people and their government, based not simply on what each of us can take, but what all of us must give to our nation. Perhaps the thing that bothers me most is how he derides and degrades the American tradition of seeing and seeking a better future. He mocks it as the vision thing. But just remember what the scripture says, where there is no vision, the people Paris. Clinton chose Tennessee Senator and former 1988 presidential candidate Al Gore to be his running mate. Choosing Gore, who is from Clinton's neighboring state of Tennessee, went against the popular strategy of balancing a southern candidate with a northern partner. Gore did serve to balance the ticket in other ways, as he was perceived as strong on family values and environmental issues. Clinton and Gore began a bus tour around the United States shortly thereafter, while the Bush quail campaign began to criticize Clinton's character, highlighting accusations of infidelity and draft dodging. 
We have no way of confirming that. The uncle is dead. We never, they'll never heard of that before. And the source is a Republican. It's absurd that the story got as far as it did. No credible basis for the story. The Bush campaign emphasized its foreign policy successes, such as Desert Storm and the end of the Cold War. Bush also contrasted his military service to Clinton's lack thereof and criticized Clinton's lack of foreign policy expertise. However, as the economy was the main issue, Bush's campaign floundered across the nation, even in strongly Republican areas, and Clinton maintained leads with over 50% of the vote nationwide consistently. The campaign continued with a lopsided lead for Clinton through September, until Ross Perot decided to re-enter the race. I like the fact that he offers hope and promise for the future. This is the first time since 1968 that I've been involved in a presidential candidacy. I think he'll make a great president. I think he's uh, fully qualified. I like what he did with the state of Arkansas. And I think, he'll, I think he can lead our country back to prosperity. I think Clinton has shown us what very few candidates have, and that is that he understands what human brokenness is about, and he showed honesty and uh, perseverance in the face of that. And I think that's a, a wonderful invitation to us all. Initially, Perro's return saw the Texas billionaire's numbers stay low until he was given the opportunity to participate in a trio of unprecedented three-man debates. The race narrowed as Perro's numbers significantly improved as Clinton's numbers declined, while Bush's numbers remained more or less the same from earlier in the race as Perro and Bush began to hammer at Clinton on character issues once again. They have had the White House so long that they've run out of energy, run out of ideas, run out of direction, and they ought to be run out of town. And with your help, we can. This is not a matter of party. It's a matter of people and the country and the future of America. We've got to change this country. A government that's fair to everybody, not just the privileged few. A government that brings us together instead of dividing us. A government that faces our problems and tells the people the truth instead of denying them until election time and then trying to throw money at them at the last minute. I tell you, we can do better than that. Throughout election night, Clinton overperformed in rural areas of the country. Clinton also won rural voters in the South and Midwest, carrying states such as Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Louisiana, Georgia and Iowa. Clinton's charisma, combined with an impressive campaign staff, resulted in victory. Clinton defeated incumbent Republican President George Bush amid a slumping U.S. economy and became the first president born after World War II. My fellow Americans, on this day, with high hopes and brave hearts, in massive numbers, the American people have voted to make a new beginning. Organizational theorists have proposed that this campaign structure adopted an effective blend of informality with clear goal definition, which allowed for structured creativity. The exploitation of key strategic blunders by the Bush campaign, including violating a no new tax promise, also allowed for impressive gains. In 1993 saw the start of America's first Democratic presidency in a dozen years. In his first address to the nation on February the 15th, 1993, 
Clinton announced his intention to raise taxes to cap the budget deficit. This week, Congress will cast a few crucial vote on my plan for economic recovery. In a comprehensive economic plan, there are always places for give and take. But from the first day to this day, I have stood firm on certain ideas and ideals that are at the heart of this plan. Tonight, I can report to you that every one of those principles is contained in the final version of the plan. First, the largest deficit reduction in history, nearly $500 billion with more spending cuts than tax increases. Rather than the games and gimmicks of the past, this plan has 200 specific spending cuts, and it reduces government spending by more than $250 billion. We cut more than 100,000 positions from the federal payroll by attrition. We freeze discretionary spending for five years. We limit pay increases for federal employees. On February the 17th, in a nationally televised address to a joint session of Mr. Congress, President, Clinton Speaker, unveiled his economic plan. Members of the House and the Senate, distinguished Americans here as visitors in this chamber, as am I, it is nice to have a fresh excuse for giving a long speech. <laughs> when presidents speak to Congress and the nation, from this podium, typically they comment on the full range and challenges and opportunities that face the United States. But this is not an ordinary time, and for all the many tasks that require our attention, I believe tonight one calls on us to focus, to unite, and to act, and that is our economy. For more than anything else, our task tonight as Americans is to make our economy thrive again. Let me begin by saying that it has been too long, at least three decades since a president has come and challenged Americans to join him on a great national journey, not merely to consume the bounty of today, but to invest for a much greater one tomorrow. The plan focused on deficit reduction rather than a middle-class tax cut, which had been high on his campaign agenda. In 1993, Clinton made a major speech to Congress regarding a health care reform plan aimed at achieving universal coverage through a national health care plan. This was one of the most prominent items on Clinton's legislative agenda and resulted from a task force headed by Hillary Clinton. Today I am announcing the formation of the President's Task Force on National Health Reform. Although the issue is complex, the task force's mission is simple. Build on the work of the campaign and the transition. Listen to all parties and prepare health care reform legislation to be submitted to Congress within 100 days of our taking office. This task force will be chaired by the First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton. I think that in the coming months, the American people will learn, as the people of our state did, that we have a First Lady of many talents, but who most of all can bring people together. Though at first well received in political circles, it was eventually doomed by well-organized opposition from conservatives, the American Medical Association, and the health insurance industry. However, John F. Harris, a biographer of Clinton's, states the program failed because of a lack of coordination within the White House. Controversial events within Clinton's administration, as well as his own personal conduct, would eventually provide opportunities for his opponents to damage him politically, and First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton as well. Personal tragedy for the Clintons occurred as Vince Foster, deputy White House counsel and lifelong friend of the president, was found shot dead in a park just outside Washington from an apparent suicide. Huge controversy erupted five months later when it was revealed that federal investigators had been denied access to Foster's White House office, but that Clinton aides had entered the office within hours of Foster's death. Speculation arose in the media that documents related to the Whitewater Development Corporation might have been removed. A month before his death, Foster had filed three years of delinquent Whitewater corporate tax returns. 
the Whitewater controversy would eventually spark a federal investigation of President Clinton and the First Lady, that through a strange and remarkable series of political manoeuvrings and personal failings, would ultimately lead to the first ever impeachment of an elected president. It was a good investment offered by somebody who knew a lot, who could provide a lot of good uh, advice, and I was lucky and made the decision to stop when I did. Clinton was likewise deeply involved in the Middle East peace process to negotiate peace agreements between Israel and the Palestinians, as well as with the Arab governments of Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. Clinton personally arranged for the peace accord to be signed at the White House on September 13, 1993. The agreement allowed a limited Palestinian self-rule in the Israeli-occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. Mr. President, thank you, thank you, thank you. In July 1994, Clinton helped coordinate a historic compromise between longtime enemies, Israel and Jordan, to end their state of war. With this agreement between Jordan's King Hussein and Israel's Rabin, Jordan became only the second Arab state after Egypt to normalize relations with Israel. In the 1996 presidential election, Clinton was re-elected, receiving 49.2% of the popular vote over Republican Bob Dole and reform candidate Ross Perot, becoming the first Democratic incumbent since Lyndon Johnson to be elected to a second term and the first Democrat since Franklin Roosevelt to be elected president more than once. In 1997, Clinton finally had a chance to sign a major health care bill into law. The state children's health insurance program passed through the efforts of First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, who wrote and chaired the task force on the unsuccessful universal plan in the first two years of the Clinton administration. Throughout 1998, there was a controversy over Clinton's relationship with a but young White House intern, Monica Lewinsky. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Ms. Lewinsky. However, after it was revealed that investigators had obtained a semen stained dress as well as testimony from Lewinsky, Clinton changed tactics and admitted that an improper relationship with Lewinsky had taken place. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. It constituted a critical lapse in judgment and a personal failure on my part for which I am solely and completely responsible. Faced with overwhelming evidence, he apologized to the nation, agreed to pay a court fine, settled his sexual harassment lawsuit with Paula Jones, was temporarily disbarred for a period of five years from practicing law. He was not tried for perjury in a court. However, he did admit to testifying falsely in a carefully worded statement as part of a deal to avoid indictment for perjury. I think there is a fancy way to say that I have sinned. It is important to me that everybody who has been hurt know that the sorrow I feel is genuine. First and most important, my family, also my friends, my staff, my cabinet, Monica Lewinsky and her family. Clinton was the first two-term Democratic president since Franklin Roosevelt. In a period of increasingly divided politics, Clinton moved his policies more to the center to appeal to mainstream America. Despite being impeached, he remained a very popular president. I'm very grateful to be able to turn over the reins of leadership to a new president, with America in such a strong position to meet the challenges of the future. It's my greatest privilege to introduce to you the First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Within days of becoming First Lady, Hillary Clinton was clearly driven to help make change in whatever way she could.
She was quickly named by her husband to head the President's Task Force on Healthcare Reform, overseeing research and numerous committees composed of medical and insurance professionals. Clinton has said that her proudest accomplishment as First Lady was her involvement in pushing the Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1997, which altered and streamlined the federal regulations regarding foster care and adoption of handicapped children. I think she would like very much to run for political office. And she's a great campaigner, and I think she would make an excellent senator. In 1999, Hillary Clinton formed an exploratory committee to pursue the possibility of running for the U.S. Senate seat to be vacated by Daniel Patrick Monaghan, the New York Democrat. On February the 6th, 2000, Hillary Clinton officially announced her bid to become the next senator of New York. Even before Mrs. Clinton officially declared her candidacy, the contest was being billed as the race of the century. New York voters and political pundits alike had been anticipating a race between the First Lady and the outspoken mayor of New York City. I think she has some new ideas, and I think that it would be refreshing to have somebody with some new ideas in the Senate in New York. If it's Rudy Giuliani and Hillary, it's going to be the most fun campaign um, I think she has no idea what New York is about, and it's fine if she wants to run. Robert Kennedy ran and wasn't a resident, and she actually resident. She doesn't even have to live in New York until she gets elected by the rules. Um, I think she's going to get eaten alive. She hates the media, and I think it's a big mistake, and it's going to be a lot of fun to watch, but they're going to chew her up and spit her out. The traditional narrative of the 2000 Senate race, the first time Hillary Clinton and Rudy Giuliani faced each other in an election, is that Giuliani was forced to drop out of the race in May because of the sudden emergence of personal issues. But in reality, Rudy Giuliani was already losing. Hillary Clinton's relentless ground game had slowly eaten away at his lead, but Rudy had done the bulk of the damage himself. In early 2000, polls showed Rudy beating Hillary. Then Hillary began her long march through the snow, and Rudy reminded New York voters again and again what an abrasive figure he could be. The more he made Clinton appear to be a victim and himself a bully, the better Clinton fared. It was not until May when Rudy Giuliani's Senate hopes were sidelined that Lazio, a congressman little known outside his Long Island district, was thrust into the limelight. Lazio, unsurprisingly, began to campaign exactly as Giuliani had back when he was seen as the inevitable victor. Once again, the GOP Senate candidate made Hillary the issue. Twice in one race, a Republican candidate's attacks on Hillary had proved no net benefit. In 2000, Hillary Rodham Clinton became the first president's wife to win elected office, defeating Republican Representative Rick Lazio in the most expensive, highest profile Senate race in American history. As an advocate for her state, Senator Clinton led a bipartisan effort to bring broadband access to rural communities co-sponsored the 21st Century Nanotechnology Research and Development Act, included language in the Energy Bill to provide tax-exempt bonding authority for environmentally conscious construction projects and introduced an amendment calling for funding of new job creation to repair, renovate and modernise public schools. After the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, on the World Trade Center in downtown New York City, Senator Clinton worked to secure $21.4 billion in funding to assist cleanup and recovery, to provide health tracking for first responders and volunteers at Ground Zero, and to create grants for redevelopment. This is 
a call to action. I've spoken with the White House at length, encouraging them to put into the president's budget money to continue the treatment program that has now started. Without the president's budget commitment, the program that is treating many of these victims will end. I believe this is a moral responsibility of our nation. We owe it to these responders, the residents and others who were sickened because of the attack on our country. Yes, I'm very pleased with how Hillary Clinton has taken care of New York politics and taken care of the people that are involved here in New York City. And she really cares about the people at the site, especially all the health problems that have come about. And I think she'd very much like to take care of that. Um, and she'd be a good candidate for a presidential election coming up. On the 20th of January, 2007, two years to the day before the next presidential inauguration, Senator Clinton filed with the Federal Elections Commission to declare her formation of an exploratory presidential campaign committee. Nine months later, she formally declared her candidacy for the US presidency. This was unprecedented. Clinton proved to be the first woman in history who occupied a position of elective national office as a member of a national party to enter and remain in a presidential primary race to the end of the season. And the unusual precedent vied only with her own record in having run for and been elected to the U.S. Senate since no other woman who had been First Lady had stood for public office. It was a, um, a thorough uh, review for me about uh, the problems that we confront in the country, the particular strengths and talents that I would bring both to the race and to the White House. Uh, and I concluded uh, that uh, based on the work of my lifetime and my experience and my understanding of what our country has to confront in order to continue to make opportunity available to all of our citizens here and to restore our leadership and respect for America around the world, uh, that I would be able uh, to do that, to bring our country together to meet those tough challenges. And therefore, I decided uh, that I would uh, contest for the primary. And I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a, a great contest with a lot of talented people. Uh, and I am very confident I'm in, I'm in to win. And that's what I intend to do. You betcha. Throughout the end of 2007 and into early 2008, Senator Clinton joined in several debates with all of the other Democratic presidential candidates. In 2008, she began the primary season campaigning across the country and continuing her fundraising, which would total over $100 million. Despite her many political achievements as First Lady, it proved difficult to emphasize them since she had done so in a position that was neither official nor elective. Among the states she won in the primaries were New Hampshire, California, New York, Texas, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina, and Indiana. Although she had been predicted through 2007 as the favored candidate and likely nominee of her party, she found her Senate colleague, Barack Obama, who represented her own native state of Illinois, to be a formidable challenger. We can do better than that. That's not a Democratic agenda or a Republican agenda. That's an American agenda. By early December 2007, the race between Clinton and Obama had tightened up. Especially in the early caucus and primary states of Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. With real voting less than a month away, Obama was now ahead in some Iowa polls and had brought in ultra popular television host Oprah Winfrey to conduct joint campaign rallies in three states before large crowds. South Carolina, I do believe he's the one. 
to bring us the audacity of hope, Barack Obama. Partly in counter of the latter, Clinton brought into Iowa her daughter, Chelsea, and a very rare campaign appearance from her 88-year-old mother, Dorothy Rodham. Now, everyone running for your support is talking about change. Some people think you bring about change by demanding it, and some people think you bring about change by hoping for it. I think you make change by working really, really hard for it every single day. I'm not asking you to take me on faith. I'm not asking you to take a leap of faith. I'm asking you to look at the evidence, to look at the record. Well, you know, I am not running for president to put band-aids on our problems. I am running for president to try to solve them. We are problem-solving people. We know how to do this. We're not acting like it anymore. I will work my heart out every day to make the changes that America deserves to have. And I will be ready on day one to assume the responsibilities that we, starting tomorrow, will pass on to the next president. So please, put on your coats, warm up the car, call your friends, pick up a buddy, come out to caucus tomorrow night, and together we will make history. Thank you all so much, and God bless you. Veteran political observers reported that things are tense in Hillary land these days that the camps of Clinton and her husband were at odds, and that the campaign's plan A of being the dominating inevitable establishment candidate was at risk of fanning. And one thing you know about me is that after 16 years of taking all their incoming fire, I am still here, much to their dismay. In times of crisis, people tend to look to more charismatic leaders, people with more fire, with more emotional intensity. What you see is a Hillary Clinton who's a pretty good politician, but a Barack Obama who's become a rock star. Although Clinton was the 25th woman to run for U.S. president, she was the first female candidate to have held a highly probable chance of winning the nomination of a major party and the presidential election. Maggie Thatcher, Golda Meir, Indira Gandhi, a lot of other countries have had women, so we're a little lagging behind here, I, I would say. Following Clinton's choked-up moment in New Hampshire and surprise victory there the following day, discussion of gender's role in the campaign moved front and centre. Women following the campaign recalled a series of criticisms of Clinton, such as the pitch of her voice, a debate moderator's question of whether she was likeable, and Obama's reply that she was likeable enough, felt by some to be condescending and hecklers' demands that she iron their shirt as motivations for re-examining who they would support in the contest. In the initial delegate selection event of 2008, she placed third with 29.45% of the state delegate selections in the January 3, 2008 Iowa Democratic Caucus to Obama's 37.58% and Edwards's 29.75%. In terms of the actual number of delegates that would later be selected to the national convention, the difference between the top three candidates was minor, with Clinton possibly ahead of Edwards. Nevertheless, in terms of damaging her image as the inevitable leader in the race and giving Obama considerable momentum, this was a major blow to Clinton's campaign. In the wake of the Iowa defeat, the campaign hoped that Bill Clinton could help salvage a win in New Hampshire, where he had achieved a political comeback in his 1992 presidential campaign. As he had in Iowa, the former president campaigned intensively, but his New Hampshire appearances failed to draw large or enthusiastic crowds. 
On the day before the primary, press reports indicated that Hillary Clinton's advisers were pessimistic about the immediate future, thinking it was unlikely she would be able to win either New Hampshire or South Carolina. We know what we need is someone ready on day one. I know we're ready. Thank you all and God bless you. Issues of race came to the forefront as campaigning began for the January 26 South Carolina primary, the first to feature large African-American participation in the Democratic electorate. First, in the closing stages of the New Hampshire campaign, Bill Clinton had referred to Obama's claim that he has been a staunch opponent of the Iraq war from the beginning as a fairy tale, which some subsequently thought was a characterization of Obama's entire campaign. After South Carolina, the Clinton campaign sought to find a gentler role for Bill Clinton, whose actions during the South Carolina campaign were suspected of having polarized the Democratic electorate and harming Hillary Clinton's standing among women. In addition to having contributed to Ted Kennedy's decision to endorse Obama. It's time again for a new generation of leadership. It is time now for Barack Obama. On the 3rd of June, 2008, Senator Obama won the necessary number of delegate pledges. Hillary Clinton suspended her campaign several days later and delivered a stirring concession speech in Washington, D.C. to her supporters, emphasizing that she was not interested in having a cult personality following, but in her party achieving dramatic change in the executive branch. This one is for you. She addressed the National Democratic Convention and endorsed the candidacy of Obama. The way to continue our fight now to accomplish the goals for which we stand is to take our energy, our passion, our strength, and do all we can to help elect Barack Obama, the next president of the United States. I endorse him and throw my full support behind him. Throughout the fall, she campaigned vigorously on his behalf, and after he won the 2008 election, he named her as his Secretary of State. In January of 2009, Hillary Clinton became the 67th Secretary of State, the third woman and the only former First Lady to serve in this capacity. Halfway through the first term of the Obama administration, Secretary Clinton had traveled over half a million miles to 77 countries. She has employed not only the diplomatic tactics traditionally used by those in her position, but political skills also learned through her White House and Senate years. The challenge is to create a global framework that recognizes the different needs and responsibilities of developed and developing countries alike. As Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton has focused special attention beyond her required duties to focus on the international rights of women, economic empowerment in financially depressed regions of the world, equal access to education, employment, health care and legal recourse for women in all countries has been an unwavering aspect of her career, from First Lady to Senator to Secretary of State. When Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, she pledged a smart power policy that meant striking up a close working relationship with Secretary of Defense Robert Gates while reshaping the State Department to emphasize development and people-powered diplomacy. She deployed her personal star power in direct contacts with the public overseas, speaking clearly about human rights and freedom of expression on the internet. She's been tough too. When China was over-assertive about the South China Sea, she rallied other nations, 
When Libya's Gaddafi threatened to massacre civilians in Benghazi, she was key in building support in the UN for the multilateral military action that is helping to protect those civilians. She has strengthened American alliances in Europe and Asia, while also engaging the emerging powers of China, India and Brazil. The United States has thrived as an open society, a principled nation and a global leader. And we cannot and will not live in fear, sacrifice our values or pull back from the world. Closing our borders, for example, might keep out some who would do us harm, but it would also deprive us of entrepreneurs, ideas and energy, things that help define who we are as a nation and ensure our global leadership for years to come. But above all, Hillary has set a model of how to be a member of a team of rivals. Unlike in many administrations that have suffered from friction between state, defence and the White House, Barack Obama's strongest rival in 2008 has become one of the most effective and loyal supporters in an administration that has been notably cohesive on foreign policy. While the Clintons lead separate professional lives, they deal with some of the same leaders and issues. The William J. Clinton Foundation works in more than 40 countries on health, climate change and economic development, often collaborating with governments. there are those who believe that outside of political manoeuvring, the Clintons' partnership will do far more good than harm in the world. If Bill Clinton has influenced his wife's foreign policy interests, she has also most certainly guided his. Opinion aside, Bill and Hillary Clinton are clearly driven individuals. Team together, they are formidable and one of the world's great power couples. <laughs>